Um, okay, so um, I am Ben Rockwood. Um, I'm the director of IT uh, and operations over at Chef, but I am first and foremost a system administrator. That's what I started doing. That's what I will always do. That's what I will do when I when I die. Um, and as a system administrator, I think way too hard about low-level things. I always want to go to first principles, dig as deep, as deep, as deep as I possibly can to understand things. And then once I've done that, I want to extract out tools that can be used to help me solve real-world problems. Um, and one of the fun things about uh, the, the DevOps movement is it has a lot of roots. And one of its primary roots is Agile. Right? Originally, before we were DevOps, we were Agile operations. And Agile really has its roots in Lean, and Lean has its roots in uh, scientific management. And so you'll find that I tend to move up and down the stack because I don't believe that you ever really truly understand anything unless you understand the, the causal roots beneath it. So sometimes I go a little bit deep. Some people like that, some people don't, but we're, we're going to dive through. Of all the things that I found out of all the causal roots, one of the most powerful tools that I found is A3. Um, it's something that I've used in, in all the operations teams that I've managed over the course of the last 10 years, and every team that I've used it in found, uh, became wildly successful using it. And so I'm really hoping that you see some, some joy in it too. It is, in fact, the engine of Lean. It is the engine that keeps Lean actually functioning. Um, it is the secret behind Kaizen. Um, and it is the keys to a learning organization. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you guys about this is a lot of people say, hey, we should do that. We should, we should be continuously improving. And you're like, yeah, that sounds great. I want to do that. I totally want to do that. How, how do you do that? Or they're like, well, just continuously improve. And you're like, yay, I'm going to continuously improve. Uh, how? We'll just try hard. But I'm a sysadmin, so I want a tool. And I've got a good one. So let's first talk about continuous improvement. What is continuous improvement? Um, really inspired by the idea Kaizen. Kaizen literally in, in Japanese means change for the better. The premise is to make many small, tiny improvements um, day to day in practical, real world work, not you know just on a whiteboard, but in real world work that hopefully adds up over time to big, big gains, right? And that's not a new concept, right? You know, how do you lose 100 pounds? You lose one and then you lose another one, and then you lose another one, and then you lose another one. How do you run a marathon? You run, you know, 100 feet, and then you run a mile, and then you run five miles, right? Not a new concept. Kaizen really is a way of life. It's a way of approaching how you do things all the time. Um, sometimes you will actually hear the, 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 the concept of a Kaizen event. Let's get everyone together and improve. Yeah, that works. Um, when you think about Kaizen, though, this is really, really key. I'm not going to belabor the point, but you need to be thinking small, tiny. So whatever you think is a thing that you could do in order to improve um, some individual process or something that you do, whatever you think that improvement is, it's too big. Make it smaller. And then make it even smaller than that. And then we start getting to things that are actually implementable. Okay? So Kaizen needs to be tiny, 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 but continuous. I want to make sure that you understand that there's another concept out there, which is kaikaku. It's the other side. And this is radical improvement. This is when you realize that making tiny improvements to a process is the wrong thing to do, that the thing is fundamentally wrong, and you need to blow that shit up. Right? And sometimes you've got to be real honest. you just got to start over. Okay? So blow that shit up. But also know the difference. Right? Know the difference, and if you're not sure, debate it. Um, but make sure you know both. The premise with radical improvement in Kaikaku is really you know, major overhaul when something is just on the wrong course to begin with and start a new course um, as soon as possible so you can get back to Kaizen. We always want to be doing Kaizen, but that doesn't mean we want to improve something that's fundamentally flawed. Okay? Use it very sparingly, but know that it's there. Okay. Now, I told you that, that DevOps has its roots in Agile, which has its roots in Lean, which has its roots in scientific management. These are the, the, uh, the, the pioneers that really led up to Lean. Guy on the left is uh, Schuhart, then we have Deming, then we have Ono. Right? I'm sure you all have heard the history of Lean. Lean is the American term for the Toyota production system. The Toyota production system was created at Toyota from uh, Ono back uh, after World War II when they believed that they had three years to catch up to American industry or the country was entirely screwed. In order to learn from American industry, um, after we bombed the daylights out of Japan, we sent all our best managers over there to teach them how to rebuild their industry because that's what we do as Americans. We're fucking awesome. 
<laughs> more over beers later, right? Um, one of the people that went over was Deming. Deming taught him a lot of things. But the funny thing is, is Deming never claimed to be an independent genius, actually. He was a disciple of Schuhart. Schuhart is awesome. Why? Because he worked at Belcar, right? Come on. We're, we're systems people. You've got to love Belcar, right? Okay. Anyway. Um, Schuhart was a master of uh, statistical process control. And the Japanese really wanted to learn it. So Deming came over and taught them all of Schuhart's tricks on how to do statistical process control. And so a lot of these ideas that informed um, what Ono created as a Toyota production system and then became lean all actually came out of Deming, which came out of Schuhart. Okay? So you've got to know the history. One of the things that Deming kind of at the end of his life he sort of brought together as like the great framework of what he was trying to propose was the system of profound knowledge because it sounds fucking awesome. And it has four components. Appreciation of a system. We always think in systems. Systems, 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 right? An understanding of variation, incredibly important. There are two types of variation. There's special uh, common cause variation, and then there's special cause variation, right? When you're looking at those graphs, you see that graph go up and down, up and down, up and down all day long. That's common cause, right? Just normal sort of stuff that happens. That big old spike that makes you go, shit, what was that? That is your special cause. That's the one you want to focus on, not those little tiny blips. This is one of these things in seasonality and data analysis we want to think about. Then there's the theory of knowledge. What the fuck does that mean, right? That's a little uh, ambiguous. And psychology, because ultimately all these systems are composed of people. The theory of knowledge comes from something called pragmatism, right? All you philosophy people are like, yay, pragmatism. America's homegrown philosophy, right? We created one. It's awesome. It's pragmatism. Came from Pierce on the left there, um, really built on uh, by a... a uh, Henry and then Lewis. C.I. Lewis is less well known, but the most influential of them, and also Dewey made it very practical. Now, why am I telling you about pragmatism? What the hell does that have to do with anything? Being a pragmatist does not mean that you're simply a pragmatic person. Sometimes when we say pragmatic, we mean somebody who follows their gut, somebody who just does something that's very practical and sort of works. When we talk about pragmatism, we're talking about something very specific, which is an approach that assesses the truth of meaning of theories or beliefs in terms of the success of their practical application. What we're talking about is epistemology, how we know what we know. And it's really important that we consider this idea, even though it's a real base one, um, we need to think, are we focusing on, on, on a, um, uh, are we focusing on ideology and are we focusing on kind of the wholeness of truth or are we focusing on what actually works in our environment to determine what is or is not true, okay? Just because Etsy does it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a thing that you should do in your environment because your environment is not Etsy's environment. Same with Amazon, same with Netflix, same with anyone else. How do you determine if something is true or not? You determine if it's true or not as to whether or not it works in your environment, right? So always thinking from the standpoint of pragmatism that I'm going to solve problems in my unique context for my unique context, not as universal constants, is a really important place to start. And that's where we always want to start, okay? Um, that theory of knowledge that Deming talked about actually was a reference back to this book, this is C.I. Lewis's book, um, Mind in the World Order. It is a philosophical proof, which means it's hard to read. It's incredibly interesting, but it's one of those books like you read it and you're like, wow, that was amazing. And then five minutes later, you're like, I don't really know what it's saying. <laughs> so you read it again and you're just like, I love that book. Okay? So these ideas of, of focusing on what is is something that was a seed at the beginning of the 20th century that really was important to Schuhart. Um, through C.I. Lewis's work, then was passed on to Deming, then came up through Ono, and now is one of the fundamental roots of everything that we're doing today that originated out of that movement. So real important thing to know, that's out there, that's a big kernel of that truth, and it comes all the way through to today, okay? All right, so one of the ways that they needed a tool to wrap around this idea of pragmatism and to to uh, bring it into day-to-day -day use. And so they created this thing called the PDSA um, cycle. Plan, do, study, act. Some of you will have heard this as the Deming cycle, which was actually PDCA, check, act. 
um, the original shoe heart um, cycle was PDSA, and the funny thing is, is even though they call it the Deming cycle, Deming never actually called it. He always called it the shoe heart cycle. So, I don't know. The messenger gets more, more love. But this is something you guys have probably seen before, right? And you probably think, oh, I know that. Every time somebody is really boring and bureaucratic, they totally bring this up. Now there's this weird dude in a kilt on stage who's telling me that I should do it. I'm very confused. Why is it important? Because it's the scientific process. It's what it is. It's a scientific process brought into business, right? In the scientific process, we ask a question, we construct a hypothesis, then we test it with experiments, we analyze those results, and then based on those results, not what we want the results to be, but based on the results we actually find, we draw conclusions. And then we decide what we're gonna do next. That's precisely what we're doing in this PDCA cycle. We plan what we need to do, we have an idea. Well, I think I need to do this, I think this should be done. Then I'm gonna go and perform some experiments. Then I'm gonna look at those experiments and say, do they actually match? Is this what I thought I was going to see? What does this tell me? And then act, I'm gonna finally get to decide what to do with it. And this is a little bit confusing. I remember the first time I saw this, I'm like, you do and you act. Uh, at the beginning and the end, what's all that about? But it's really performing experiments and then deciding what you do with those experiments. And the thing is, is PDCA is something that, that kind of goes off the rail. So Toyota came up with this concept called the A3 framework. The A3 framework is a way of taking this PDCA cycle and encoding it into a document. One of the things that created this document is that, and I'm sure you've never seen this before, people were coming up to Ono with like 36 page project proposals and going, hey, something's wrong, here's this thing, tell us what you think. And he was like, eh, no, 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 thanks. You can keep that, I don't want it. He's like, you know what, if it doesn't fit on a sheet of paper, I, I don't even want to read it. Make it fit on one sheet of paper. So, being engineers, what do they do? They found a really big piece of paper. <laughs> this is an A3, this is where the term actually comes from. So this is an international standard A3 sheet of paper. And to give you an idea of the size, fold it in half and you have US letter paper. Okay, so this is bigger than legal. This is a big piece of paper. So they said, okay, we'll put it on one sheet of paper. And over time, they refine this. And what you have here in this, this document is that PDSA cycle um, drawn out here. And the first, we start at the top left-hand side. If you guys are familiar with the business canvas, this is very similar. In fact, I think business canvases actually ultimately came from this. Um, we have a problem statement at the top. What's our problem? We have uh, a background out there. We have current condition future condition, we have an analysis, we have our experiments, then we have our results confirmation, and finally we have um, our future plans. So let's break these down a little bit more. And in A3, this is a thinking process. This is not a form. This is the first big thing you gotta understand about, about an A3. It's not about the piece of paper. It's absolutely not about the paper. Um, in particular, because when you fill out a form, what do you do? It's a point in time. You sit down, you fill out the form. This is not a form that you fill out at one time. This is a thinking process, and it's a physical artifact that constrains you to work through that process to make sure that you're following it well. So on this piece of paper, we're gonna have a problem statement. What is, this is gonna be a very brief one-liner sort of, what's the problem, right? Monitoring blows, right? But you gotta set a context. What are we talking about? The next thing you're gonna do is just describe the problem background. Why should anyone care, right? This is great, if, I, if somebody just goes and reads your A3, why should they, why is this a problem? Why should anyone care about this? This is what some of us might call a business case. It should be very short, but it should be packed with data. Then we're gonna describe two things that are the key here. You're gonna describe your current state, what is actually going on right now. Guess what, this means you actually have to understand what's going on right now, and a lot of times on our systems they're so complex, we're like, it's a crappy system. Why is it a crappy system? Because I have no idea how it works. That's why it's a crappy system. Like, no, we need to go and figure out how it works. Gotta do the back work. Figure out what is your current state? What is actually going on right now? And then you're going to have to figure out what it is you want. Not a goal, not a simple goal of I, I, I want to go this far. Describe the future, this is a vision. This is what I actually want. I want to not ever wake up at night, ever. Right? 
That's a good future state. You have to describe that. Once you know where you're at and you know clearly where you want to go, now we can do a gap analysis. This is called a root cause analysis. Um, um, different people call it different things, but essentially what we're doing is a gap analysis. Why am I where I'm, where I'm at and how do I get to where I want to go? And the real focus is going to be, for a lot of us, why aren't you already there, right? If it's so easy, you'd already be there. There's a reason that you're not there, and these have to do with constraints. Our environments are full of constraints. And one of the important things to do with the desired future state is to really think outside the box. I mean, think, think, think big if you want to about what kind of future state you want. Um, because if you don't know what you want to do without constraints, there's no way in hell you're going to know what you want to do inside constraints. Constraints are the thing that limit everything we do. Anyway, so once you've done this analysis and you know where you're at and where you want to go, and you've done that analysis of, about wh what, what's, what's going on there, now you can go through and figure out what you need to do to try and close that gap. And these are going to be the experiments. You're going to go off and you're going to you know, lay them all out. This is what I want to do. These are the things we're going to do. And you can do a lot of these in parallel. I mean, this does not have to be one plan. These are experiments, right? Try as many different variations as you possibly can, because the purpose here is not to solve a problem. The problem here, or the, the, the thing you're trying to do here, is to get towards what's going to solve the problem and knowing it rather than just thinking it. Once you've done those experiments, now we have to go back and review them. What worked, what didn't, what were the trade-offs, what did we think was going to happen, what actually happened. And this is where you're really going to be looking at what is that future that we want, are we getting there, and did it match what we saw in our analysis. Once you've done that, now you've learned something. Now you're a learning organization. Now you've learned something. But what do you have to do once you've learned something? Decide what to do with that new knowledge. Are you going to make it part of your standard process? Are you going to adopt it? Are you going to throw it away? Does it turn out? One thing that will commonly happen when you start with A3s is you'll find out that, the, that, that you'll get through this process. You realize you have a bunch of other things to do. So you'll spawn off a bunch of other A3s for, that are smaller because you realize you bit off more than you could chew. right? This is the flow that starts to push Kaizen. This is how Kaizen really works. And so you're thinking like, I'm a computer dude. I don't use paper. Paper? What the hell is paper? Um, obviously, I don't use paper. Um, I use Confluence. You can work in any system. This is a Confluence template we have in the Chef Wiki um, that we use for our A3s. So I have three teams that report to me. They all use A3. Um, and any time we have uh, a situation where we're not quite sure what we want to do, there's still a fuzzy sort of, uh, there's a fuzziness in whatever the problem is we're trying to solve or how we're doing it, we always, it's like A3, it's time for A3, get an A3 going, right? And we'll sit there in a meeting and start filling it out and start thinking it through, right? Where, where are we good, where are we weak, where do we know, where do we not know? And it gives us a framework to push through. And like I said, you're going to go through this in, in over time. This is not something you just fill out at one time, right? There's obviously, you can't know what the results of your experiments are going to be before you've done the experiments. You can't know what experiments you're going to do until you've done your gap analysis. So it's a process. This is an example of a, a real A3 um, from Chef. This was uh, for the Ubuntu 10.04 EOL. Anybody deal with that one? Yeah, yeah, one brave soul admitted it. Um, we had a bunch of 1004 systems that were still out there, um, and we needed to get them upgraded. Um, and so we wanted to think through what was the best way to get this done, right? And so you can see some of the, the problem description up there on the top, the background, the current condition, the bottom kind of got cut off here. And then on the right, you can see each of the experiments that we did um, in order to get us going in that direction. There's a number of different times that you can use A3. It's a pretty flexible tool. Um, problem solving is, is definitely the most, most common, common use. Um, project planning, um, it's really great when you want to do project planning you're not sure what's involved. Project proposals and in, 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 in initiatives, when you want to show out an idea, again, you're going to go through that same process of what's my current state, what's my future state, what's the analysis, and what do we need to do to get there. Um, really good in um, retrospectives and postmortems about, you know, hey, we see, keep seeing the systemic problem. How do we actually get towards something that's sustainable? And just about any other 
um, case you can think of. Very, very powerful and flexible tool. Some best practices when using A3 as, as a process is always just keep it simple. Don't get clever. Clever doesn't help anything. Um, keep it simple as possible. Um, if it won't fit on the form, so in, in the case of a paper, you're physically constrained by size. In a wiki, of course, you can just keep going on as long as you want to, but there's a point at which it's just like, come on, dude, this is too much. Um, it becomes obvious, and that, that's something you should be used to as strength. When, you, when you're running out of space, um, it's a good sign that your problem is just too big. Um, reach for them as often as you can. This is why it's a wiki uh, template that, that we have. We can pull them out whenever we need to. And again, never, ever, ever forget, it's not about the form. It's a logical thinking process, right? And a very powerful one. Now, the, the way that you'll see this, is if you actually ever go into a manufacturing plant, when you walk onto the, onto the factory floor, you'll normally see a wall covered in A3 sheets of paper. And what you'll see is, is all their current improvement initiatives that are moving out with their A3s. So it's kind of fun to look through, and everyone knows the state of everything all the time. Um, in, in our teams, we just keep them in our wiki on, you know, linked off the, the homepage so everyone can see that we're doing it. And it's a real nice way for people to come in and get a sense of what we're doing. It's, it's, it's even more useful than just having a Kanban board around because, frankly, it's nice that everyone has X year Kanban board, but a lot of times they look at it and they're like, I have no idea what any of that stuff means. I have access to it, hooray, but what does it mean? These are a lot more clear. And this is something we can build on. I mean, this is, a, this is a basic tool that can always be built upon. So one of the things I wanted to do was incorporate the ideas of design thinking into this process. Because if you look at the process of doing design thinking, um, these steps, you empathize, you develop a deep understanding of a, of a user's challenge. Like, really put yourself in the, the end user's shoes. Like, what is, what is a consumer or, or a user really grappling with? And then you define based on that. You clearly articulate a problem that you want to solve. You ideate, you brainstorm potential solutions that will solve that, that problem, select and develop a solution. Then you prototype what that solution is going to gonna look like. And then you test it, iterate, put it in front of your users, see if they like it, if they don't, and then iterate, iterate, iterate. Well, that design thinking process sure sounds a lot like what we are doing in, in, in the DevOps side of things. And it looks really similar to the Agile flow. It looks really similar to what we're doing in the Lean continuous improvement side. So what I decided to do was to merge these things together. And I created what's called the A3.2 um, template. And you'll notice just a little bit of change here. Um, we've got the problem description. So I call it investigation, exploration, reflection, and implementation. Um, problem description stays, but then I add in a section on stakeholders. And the stakeholders is a really loaded term that generally turns a lot of us off. So what we're going for was stakeholders in the sense of, of, of design thinking, in that I want to go around to all the different people who have some stake in whatever we're doing. They're going to see it, they're going to touch it, they're going to, they're going to judge us on it, whatever. They're going to be somehow involved in this process. I'm going to go to them and I'm going to start asking them drilling, penetrating questions to figure out what is it that you really want. What do you really want? Well, I want a thing. I got it. Okay, you want a thing. What do you really want in the thing? Well, I want it to do this. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Why, why, why? Right? And eventually they'll be like, because dude's a jerk and I just want to get him off my back. Great. Now I know how to make you happy is to get that dude off your back. Got it. Go around to each of your stakeholders and really drill down. What is the thing they actually really want so that you can judge your solution based on that? Then we've got the current condition. We've got the desired future state. We still have our, our analysis. But then I change um, the experiments really into prototypes, right? Um, which I think captures the idea a little bit better, too. We want to do lots of things, and we just try them to see what works, right? Reflection and implementation. What do we do once it's done? Do we create a policy? Do we onboard a new tool? You know, what do we do? Some fun quotes from um, Tiechiono, who I showed you earlier. Um, why not make the world an easier and more interesting um, so that people don't have to sweat? The Toyota style is not to create results by working hard. Underline that. Don't work hard. It's a system that says there's no limit to people's creativity. People don't go to Toyota to work. They go to think. And this is a manufacturing company, right? This is what they're saying to line workers on an assembly line. You're not here to work, you're here to think. 
And then Shingo, um, who really was kind of the, the sysadmin of, of, of the TPS world, um, Shingo was the one who came up with a lot of the technical innovations that actually made um, the Toyota production system work. Um, a relentless barrage of whys is the best way to prepare your mind to pierce the clouded veil of, of thinking caused by the status quo. Use it often. There's a real belief that, well, we should ignore lean because it has its roots in manufacturing. And what does manufacturing know about knowledge work? And when you go back to Henry Ford, where this all really started, when you look at Ono, oh they don't really see a, a difference. The application and implementation looks very different. But the fundamental root ideas are the same. And I can prove that because of the fact that we're all sitting here right now. There's a bunch of books out there that can help. Um, A3, uh, Understanding A3 Thinking, Managing to Learn is a famous book, uh, A3 Problem Solving. But always, um, if you want to understand Lean, the best roll-up book of all the fundamental concepts that is the best use of your time, if you're going to invest your time anywhere, I always recommend uh, The Fifth Discipline. It's the most bang for your buck. It'll get you where you need to go. Um, it's definitely uh, required reading. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ben.